Jonathan Arnott, please. Well, what an evening it's been, hasn't it? Um, absolutely fantastic. The food's been excellent. And I'd like to just start with a round of applause for Marianne and for the committee for organising. And thank you to, uh, to, of course, to Amjad and Louise for coming over and what superb speeches those have been. Not sure quite how impressed I am with Louise, however, who her entire speech was pretty much what I'd got in my head and had decided to, to say. Um, and then I thought, well, I'll change, I'll change that. And I thought, I'll just talk about the last couple of weeks uh, instead, because it's been a roller coaster time, as you can imagine, because we're now really into the campaign. I thought I'll start with the candidate's visit to Brussels uh, the week before last. And so Amjad then starts talking about that. So, um, so if this comes across as somewhat unprepared, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is. Uh, in Brussels, I think one thing that we all know is that the European Union is an absolutely massive, wasteful bureaucracy that's creaking at the seams. But what you don't see sometimes is the scale of it until you're actually there. One of the buildings that we went round in our tour was something called the Parliamentarium. Now, um, if anyone's got any ideas what a Parliamentarium is, answers on a postcard, please. But it cost 15 and a half million euros to build. And it was a visitor centre, uh, presumably for people to go in and uh, look at the, the, the work that the European Parliament does. Uh, so probably not very much, actually. Um, because, of course, as we all know, the laws come from the Commission and the European Parliament is there basically to rubber stamp it. Uh, so, 15 and a half million euros spent on that. And in its first year, it attracted 20,000 visitors. It was an absolute disaster. 15 and a half million euros spent on it. So, from that disaster, they thought, we're going to increase the numbers. We're going to make sure that plenty of people come to visit this. We're going to make it more exciting for people to come and visit. Well, actually, they didn't do the more exciting thing. Uh, you, you know, when, when somebody goes to visit as a guest of an MEP, uh, they get their money paid for. They get something in the region of €250 Euros, uh, as allowance for, for going across to visit. The European Parliament pays you to go there. Uh, I suppose they'd have to, really, wouldn't they? Um, and so, very simply, uh, they wanted to boost the attendance figures for the parliamentarium, so they thought, well, fair enough then, we'll just make it a compulsory part of the visit. So now the parliamentarium is fantastically successful. And, and this is how these things work, isn't it? Uh, there's a walkway that goes round in a semicircle, and it's to help MEPs get from one part of the parliament uh, to another part of the parliament fairly quickly. And so they're now in the process of spending a million pounds on insulating it so that the MEPs don't get cold as they walk from one part of the building to another. And then we had the House of History. And the House of History was supposed to cost 12 million euros to build. They built it in the site of the, for of the former nursery. And the former nursery housed 300 children and so they've had to move that somewhere else, buy a new building for that as well. And that 12 million euro building has now cost 44 million euros. It still hasn't opened. Every year they tell you it's going to open next year. And the idea of this House of History is to showcase European history. And the sort of revisionist history that they're talking about, we don't even refer to the First World War. And Jeff was clearly wrong about that. Because we when we talk about the World Wars, the Second World War was, in fact, we're told, the Second European Civil War. <laughs> now, I'm not the world's greatest expert on geography, but if you think that America and Japan are in Europe, then you've got something seriously wrong. <laughs> and I think it just reminded me what we're all fighting for. We're fighting for our freedom. We're fighting for our independence. And we're fighting to get our democracy back. 
So we came back to the UK and we thought, well, we'd best start doing something useful then, haven't we? And as out delivering leaflets, we've got a council by-election coming up in Yarn uh, shortly. And we've got Councillor Mark Chatburn of UKIP is, uh, is re-standing there. It's a staunch Conservative area. He was a Conservative, he came across to UKIP. Um, quite surprising, really, to find a staunch Conservative area in the North East. Well, it's not a solid Conservative area, a area anymore. I can tell you that just from leafleting it. Because as I was going around delivering leaflets, uh, people were opening the doors, coming out, uh, coming out, hey, you've delivered that UK leaflet through our door. Good on you, we're out of UKIP now. <laughs> and this is in an area that's supposedly rock solid Conservative, the most safe uh, Conservative ward in that, uh, in that Conservative constituency. I tell you what, it's clear that UKIP is making real breakthroughs in Conservative Party areas. Yeah. Now, I then spent a bit of time door knocking in Sunderland. Because we've got a council by-election coming up in St Anne's Ward in Sunderland. And in St Anne's Ward in Sunderland, it's over 70% Labour at the last election. Absolute rock-solid Labour. And you know what you find as you're knocking on the doors? And three people in a row, three houses in a row saying, yes, we're voting UKIP. And then when all the canvas returns get put together, it looks amazing. If you could believe every candidate's return that you saw, you'd think, we're winning that ward. So if you've got any time to go and help out in Sunderland between now and a week on Thursday, please do. Uh, because that would make a real difference, wouldn't it? But this is what we're doing in UK. This is what we're doing. We're taking votes in Tory areas. We're taking votes in Labour areas. We're taking votes in Lib Dem areas. Because although there are no-go areas for every other party, there is no such thing as a no-go area for UKIP. We take votes wherever we go. Yeah. Well, this last week, the campaign proper really kicked off. We had the first hustings of the campaign, Newcastle University, and that was interesting. Up against the Labour lead candidate, the Lib Dem lead candidate, and no one's ever seen Callan Ann, so we're up against the number three Conservative candidate. And that was really fascinating, because Labour trotted out the old line. I, 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 I dared to point out that the European Commissioner, Vivienne Redding, had said that 70% of our laws are now emanating from Brussels. I dared to tell the truth about how many laws are coming from the European Union and about how powerless, sadly, our own Parliament in Westminster has become. And when I dared to say that, she said, well, hang on a minute, there's something from the House of Commons Research Library that says that these statutory instruments, it's actually between 6.1% and 14%. So why don't you try getting honest with the British people? Well. I said immediately, because I've learnt this one, because Labour always try this trick, Labour were trying the same trick in 2009 at the European elections. It's standard note SN slash IA slash 2888 of the House of Commons Research Library. And it's talking about how many statutory instruments, now a statutory instrument is something that switches on or off a bus lane or something like that. We're not talking about real UK laws in most in, in most instances with statutory instruments. No wonder I got that a bit tongue tied. Um, so, they're minor little details, and between 6.1% and 14% of those are to enforce EU directives. But hang on a second, since 2010, there have been over 3,500 European regulations, new European laws, what was called under the old European Constitution, European laws, that come into force in this country and never once go through Parliament. And so she didn't count a single one of those 3,500 laws coming from Brussels as being new laws in the UK. So no wonder the figure was utterly distorted. And this is the kind of attack that we get from the Labour Party. We have the same thing about our policies on tax, where they seem to suggest that somebody on virtually minimum wage would be as paying the same in tax as millionaires. Totally ludicrous. 
Because as we all know, UKIP has the policy of no tax on minimum wage. And they didn't realise. And that was what Labour was sticking on their leaflets going out in this area. That's the kind of attack we're under. Oh, wasn't it fantastic that I had, uh, had An Angelica Schneider, the Lib Dem candidate at the hustings. And she said, isn't it terrible, though, that UKIP in the European Parliament, however important it is, UKIP just don't really turn up very much. <laughs> Interesting. I said, well, I'll do you a deal. The deal I'll offer is that I will admit that Nigel Farage has a 55% voting record in the European Parliament. I'll admit that's not very good when you admit that Nick Clegg's 22% in Westminster is absolutely shocking. Yeah. She didn't get much chance to respond to that because the Conservatives piped up and said, well, they're both pretty bad, aren't they? And I said, I, I said, well, I said, maybe, but much better than Cameron's 17%. <laughs> so Angelica Schneider, as you may have seen in the press, has challenged me to a debate on the European Union. Uh, now, I'm absolutely relishing the prospect of this debate and was really looking forward to it. And I spoke to a press officer recently and her press office is starting to say, well, you know, it might be a little bit difficult to, um, to arrange this um, ITV. Well, they're interested, but they might not do it. Uh, we'll have to see what happens. Uh, maybe we could do sort of um, a debate in print, you know, in the, in the local newspapers, where we each have, a, have half a page to make our cases. I'm thinking, yeah, um, well, let's hope this debate actually happens. Let's keep up the pressure and let's try to make sure that they don't back out when they realise they're going to lose. Yes. Yeah. So ladies and gentlemen, expect these attacks to continue. We've seen the attacks on Nigel Farage and his personal life that have been vicious over the last few days. And actually, when you read the papers today, you find that even the Mirror has had to go back and say, well actually, might not be true. Well, we're going to see those attacks. Those attacks are going to come against us everywhere. We're going to see those attacks because UKIP is shaking up the political establishment. So be prepared, be ready, be ready with the facts to go straight back at them and to point out why those things are simply not true. Why are they attacking us? Because we have one thing that the other parties do not. We have common sense. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is the party of common sense. This is UKIP. So when we see that in the North, in that opinion poll that Louise referred to earlier, in the North we're on 31% and Labour on 40%. Even in the north of England, we are within touching distance of beating the Labour Party. Well, when they said to us, oh, well, UKIP's a southern party, I tell you what, we're not. We're a party that's going to make a difference in the north. We've been saying for so long, we are the real challenges to Labour here. And when we see results like this, we know that UKIP can make a difference. Because I tell you what, we're not seeing any real opposition to Labour from the Conservative Party across the whole of this region. We're not seeing any real opposition to Labour from the Liberal Democrat Party across the whole of this region. And I tell you what, when we start to take MEPs in the European Parliament, when we start to take councillors in areas such as this, that's the time when we're going to go on, make a huge difference. And ladies and gentlemen, I tell you what, I am excited for the prospect of what UKIP is going to do in 2015. I am excited for our future and I am so excited to see where UKIP eventually ends up because I believe that if Labour, Conservative and Lib Dems 
Don't start to listen. It won't just be European elections that we'll be winning. We'll start to win at every single level and we'll start to bring real, good old-fashioned British common sense back to politics in Westminster.